In today's video, we have the latest trade talk getting closer to the NHL trade deadline. Will Patrick Kane have a shot at going to the Rangers? Some feel it might be the Rangers or no trade at all. Plus, we have the latest on Yessi Pugliarvi and a new destination that he could possibly end up with. Plus, an update on the Timo Meyer to New Jersey trade we've been hearing lots of rumors about. Some updates on John Gabriel Pajot, the Islanders, the Coyotes might be looking to trade multiple other players that we haven't discussed yet. Big news from the NHL waiver wire, we have a player claimed and another player on waivers, several injury updates, and a minor league trade as well. All on coming up next. Well, welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a ton of news to talk about today and some more trade rumors as we get closer to the NHL trade deadline. So let's jump right in and get started. Uh, first up from the NHL waiver wire. Yesterday, we had three players on waivers. We had Chris Tierney of the Panthers. Uh, Joey Anderson of the Toronto Maple Leafs and Justin Kirkland as well with the Anaheim Ducks. Anderson and Kirkland have both cleared. However, Chris Tierney has been claimed, so he is no longer with the Florida Panthers. He was claimed by the Montreal Canadiens. Of course, the Canadiens um, probably seen an opportunity to bring in a veteran centerman on a short-term deal. Not a lot of money, not a lot of term, and they have a ton of injuries that they've been dealing with in their organization. So, I could certainly almost have a, because Tierney was a former senator where he played, I guess, between San Jose and Ottawa, pretty close to even for the bulk of his career here. Um, a former set line between Tierney, Hoffman, and Dadnoff. Um, I don't know if they'll actually do that or not, but it is a possibility. But Chris Tierney will go to Montreal. So he's on a one year deal, um, league minimum, contract at the NHL level. So uh, he'll get an opportunity to stay there for a little while, I would imagine. They'll probably keep him for the rest of the season, but time will tell. And a very interesting newcomer to the waiver wire today, and that's Seattle Kraken goaltender Chris Dreger. Of course, Dreger was also a member of the Florida Panthers who signed as a unrestricted free agent, but it was the, the pick uh, from Florida during the expansion draft by the Kraken. They chose to, uh, to take him into the draft and to have exclusive negotiating rights for a while as a UFA. They signed him to a three-year contract, making over $3 million bucks a year. Uh, his first year in the Kraken organization wasn't overly great. wasn't as good as he'd done in Florida, but at the same time, the team in front of him wasn't very good either. They had a very, very rough and not a lot of success in their very first uh, NHL season. So, you know, fair to say that goes hand in hand. And then after the season, he went to the World Championships and suffered a pretty significant uh, knee injury. So, of course, that is what has kept him out. He has not played this season so far. He's just ready to return after a long in a hard battle to get back and be healthy and ready to go. So he's now uh, ready, So which is why he needs waivers because they already have the two goaltenders at the NHL level. The Kraken would like to see him go to the AHL for a while before he gets an NHL crack, and here we are. So will a team claim Chris Dreger? It's possible. I mean, I would think that the fact that he's been injured um, and still has another year on his term of his contract might be something that kind of scares teams away. Um, I guess there's always teams looking for goaltending help, especially this time of year. So we'll see what happens, but an interesting name. Well, then, like I said, I think the term and the uh, injury might be, uh, you know, shying teams away. So we'll, we'll find out 2 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow. Some injury updates, and we have a really weird one in Montreal. A couple of items. Actually, Chris Weidman's been added to the injured reserve. Uh, apparently, he's been injured for um, some time. It was, it was trying to play through it, so he's going to be setting out for a little while. And Kirby Doc uh, was originally uh, missing time, which what they called um, like an illness. So there were symptoms that they referred to as just a non-COVID illness is what was keeping him out of the lineup. But now they put up an update that says after further uh, testing and examination that they've determined it's a lower body injury. That, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I guess I'm not a doctor either. So I guess if you really think about it thoroughly, from a medical standpoint, I'm not sure what could pose as a non-COVID illness and turn out to be a lower body injury. When you think lower body, you think, you know, knees, hips, ankles, those types of things. I don't really know what this could be or how long that's going to impact him. It just, it, I think it's the first time we've ever seen an update from a team go from non-COVID illness, which we now are calling a lower body injury. Anyways, it is what it is. Might seem weird, but that's because it is after all. Uh, some other updates as well. Of course, yesterday we talked about Ryan Johansson had to have foot surgery uh, after getting hurt the other night. We now know the recovery time, which is 12 weeks. So that's obviously uh, quite a long stretch there. 
Um, 12 weeks will keep him out uh, well after the NHL season and into what would be the early part of the playoffs. I mean, the Predators would have to make the playoffs and be uh, into the Conference Finals or Stanley Cup Final for him to have any chance of returning. So, uh, fair to say that his season is over um, and he should be good to go, hopefully, for next year. But that's a big blow for the Preds trying to make a playoff push. They are already having a tough enough time as it was and to lose the top six center is going to make it that much more challenging. Uh, the St. Louis Blues up activated Brandon Saad. He had been out injured, so he's ready to go. Washington is getting Alex Ovechkin back. He's returned to uh, the Capitals in uh, North America after being over in Russia after the passing of his dad. Uh, so he's come back now. Um, so I believe he'll be in the lineup here um, in the next game, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Anthony Myth, though, on the other hand, will not be. Uh, he got hurt in their previous game and has now been moved to injured reserve. Um, and I'm Doc Centerman. Adam Henrique is going to be out week to week as well. That's a big blow for for him because he was generating trade interest and was a player that even though he does have a, a bit of term left, that uh, teams were inquiring on. So um, that might hinder any potential trade deadline moves for Adam Henrique. And the Minnesota Wild are going to be without defenseman Jonas Brodin. Uh, that's going to be a big blow for them. Well, they obviously have to fight you know, continue in the battle here to get into the playoffs as well. Uh, they've been kind of up and down for the last while there of the season. Um, but Brodeen's going to miss at least four games. So that's certainly not uh, a good thing for them. That's a big blow to that back. And like I said as well, we also had a, a minor trade today. I mean, specify minor as in prospects that are not in the NHL. The Anaheim Ducks uh, traded Hunter Drew. Uh, who's a 24-year-old. Uh, he plays the right defense. Uh, I think he even plays a little bit of wing as well when called upon. Um, he's been traded to the Chicago Blackhawks in exchange for a 24-year-old centerman, Josiah Slavin. So, of course, that's the brother uh, to Jacob Slavin, the top defenseman for the Carolina Hurricanes. So, Slavin for Drew, to Burley, both 24-year-old prospects. I really think it's just a, a C. If a swap in scenery and organizations will give either one a different path and might, you know, have any better chance at getting uh, some NHL games or uh, a path to the NHL, which at that age is is not overly likely that it's going to happen for them, but you never rule it out. There is always late bloomers and players that sometimes at age 26, 27 get their first crack on it, and sometimes they stick. So we'll see what happens, and hopefully this trade works out for them. Uh, onto the trade section of the video, uh, we got a variety of things to talk about today, a lot of which comes from Elliot Friedman combination of his latest blog and uh, comments I've heard today on the Jeff Merrick show. Uh, for example, Jacob Brana in Detroit. Uh, now, that's an interesting scenario. We all thought, based on all the different reports that were out there before, that Verano was likely done in Detroit, wasn't going to play there anymore. He was likely going to stay in the minors until they found a trade or maybe consider a buyout in the offseason. There's all kinds of scenarios being discussed that were likely or rumored to be likely. And then we see news of a recall for Verano a few days back. And Friedman was talking about the fact on the Jeff Merrick show saying that that was absolutely 100% for them to showcase him. And they were curious to see uh, once the news got out that he would be in the lineup, uh, what teams would send scouts to want to see him and see what they might be able to find for a deal to move him along. Um, other NHL teams and executives around that Friedman's talked to says that a lot of them think that they might be able to get the Red Wings to kind of pay them an incentive to take Moreno's contract on where it still has a bit of term, kind of like what we've seen in the trade yesterday between Ottawa and Chicago, sending a couple of draft picks to the Blackhawks from Ottawa to take on the contract the remaining term of Nikita Zaitsev. Uh, obviously, the Blackhawks don't have any kind of cap issues. They have lots of flexibility, so they can take him on if they feel like they want to keep him around to play out the rest of the deal. And if not, if they don't uh, think they want to do that, they could buy him out this offseason, and it won't really impact things from a cap perspective for them because they don't have you know a cap issue to do with like many teams around the NHL, but Verana certainly was there to uh, to get an opportunity to see if he can showcase himself. Still seems like a trade is inevitable at some point if they can find it, and that's the hard part. It takes two to tango, and will there be enough to generate interest of Verana? Only time will tell. Now, we got some updates as well on Timo Meyer. I mean, Timo Meyer is a very interesting, restrictive free agent, a pending RFA that uh, it's expected, but not guaranteed, to be traded before the deadline. Because of his situation, San Jose... They can take their time. Uh, they know is it likely we see a deal before the deadline? I think the odds are pretty decent, but like I said, they they can take their time. They don't need to rush this. And oftentimes at the deadline, it's more about pending UFA because teams want to trade the players 
before they risk losing them for nothing, especially if they're not trending towards being a playoff team. And that makes sense of good organizational asset management. But from this guy being an RFA, they could trade them as a draft if they want to. But they figure if they can get the right offer, the right deal now, it'll work out. But we've heard a constant connection between the Sharks and the Devils. Uh, now we've heard uh, different reports from a variety of sources today indicating that what's holding things up is the Sharks are very interested in what the Devils could offer but are not offering yet. The Sharks want Dawson Mercer included in this deal. Uh, there's even some rumblings that maybe they could involve multiple players as well, and it could even involve uh, maybe uh, James Ryber coming from San Jose uh, in that deal to kind of shore up the goaltending. Maybe Mackenzie Blackwood goes the other way to get him a fresh start. Uh, lots less of a guarantee. I was just I'd seen that mentioned at one area earlier that could kind of make it a bigger deal. But regardless of the fact, uh, to get Timo Lyard in New Jersey, they're obviously looking at multiple assets, likely a first-round pick for sure, uh, and obviously you know a younger player that's going to be a first-round quality asset, and Mercer would qualify that from the 2020 draft. Uh, he's made the NHL pretty much right away. It has been a, a good player and a good, solid, productive guy getting a lot of top six time. So I understand their interest in Mercer. Uh, obviously, Timo Meyer is more productive again, a little bit older, a little bit more mature, more developed because he's been around longer. So I guess from the Sharks' perspective, they're probably looking at it saying, well, if you want us to move Meyer to your team, uh, you're going to give us one of your top young players in return because that's what we need to get things turned around here in San Jose. So it explains why the Devils have been hesitant to pull that off. Obviously, as much as they want Timo Meyer, I'm sure they don't want to part with Dawson Mercer. So I'm not sure if that's going to be a deal that will work, if they, if they will come to terms on something else, or if the Devils will cave and uh, trade Mercer. We'll have to wait and see, but I don't blame San Jose for having that as their ask. And uh, will they cave? Well, time will tell. Uh, Jesse Pugliarby, you know, in Edmonton, uh, of course, a player that's been expected to move for some time. Now, that's possible based on other moves here that is that he may not be, get moved. That That is a real possibility. But there was an interview done with uh, Avalanche winger Miko Raiden, of course, who's fellow countryman from Finland with Pugliarby and a good friend of his. Uh, and of course, they've, they've played together on uh, Team Finland before in international competitions and have been friends for quite some time, usually when their teams meet up. Uh, for games, they'll get together, go to dinner, that type of thing. So uh, certainly he talked about Pugliarby being such a good person and how he felt that uh, if you know if he was going to leave Edmonton and get a fresh scenery somewhere else, that Colorado would be a good spot for him. He said that the organization there, not only they don't just look at the talent on the ice, they really look closely at the character and personalities of the players and want to make sure they're going to be a good fit. Uh, with the group, uh, which is obviously an important thing that a lot of teams, I'm sure, factor in. And he feels that Jesse would fit in greatly, and he's a great person. and feels that there would be absolutely uh, a good connection there. So I guess we'll have to see. I'm not sure if he's going to go far enough to, to lobby his team to trade for Pugliarvi. I don't know if that's really what they need. Ideally, I think it's fair to say the Avalanche, if they're going to make a deal ahead of the deadline to defend their Stanley Cup championship, it's more likely going to be for a centerman, not a winger, but Kyle will tell it if it's not this year, maybe he ends up there later. Um, if he doesn't get traded out of Edmonton, or even if he does, it's always possible that he doesn't get qualified as an RFA this soft season. It might become a UFA. So we'll have to wait and see where things go, but just interesting. One of his countrymen kind of lobbying a little bit and praising him to, to see if he'll come to his organization. So we'll have to see where things go on that front. Uh, Jean-Gabriel Pajot, the New York Islanders, his name is still floating around the river mill as well. I'm not sure we're going to see the Islanders make a trade as long as they're in contention for playoffs, though. I know the other day we talked about the uh, fact of Scott Mayfield being on the Leafs' radar as a potential defenseman they had interest in, and I'm sure they do have interest that would make a lot of sense for what they need as well as what um, the contract that comes with them and the asking price and the guy makes a, you know, a good fit. It makes sense, but um, like I don't know if Lou's going to want to subtract from his roster with Matt Barzell already out with injury. Um, Oliver Wallstrom's out with injury. They have obviously a number of minor leaguers up there trying to, uh, you know, kind of find their way here. And, I, you know, Pajor has been out heard too. Are they going to want to subtract when the team has a chance to get into the playoffs? I don't think so. I mean, and I don't know that we're really going to know that much more before the deadline. So as a possible Pajo moves, sure. I, th I think it's more likely in the offseason. I think Pajo might be a player we're talking about for a little while longer 
after the Horvat uh, acquisition and pickup and the contract extension, I do understand why there might be some upside to possibly uh, move a center, especially like Pajot, where uh, because of his five times five contract, he's always a few years into that there. Now, now, Ella Freeman also talked about another member of the Coyotes that is getting some attention and makes a lot of sense why they would consider moving. Almost as we talked about before with the Jacob Chikrin trade, it was revealed that one of the big things holding things up and getting that deal done is that uh, the Coyotes do not want to take on any money. They want to move Chikrin out strictly for picks and prospects. Nothing that's going to impact their NHL roster and salary cap immediately. They don't really want to spend any more money than they need to. Their president there and team owner have confirmed that it's going to be some lean years that they want to keep spending down to a minimum. So therefore, uh, you know, they don't want to take any money on this deal, which is complicated considering how many teams around the NHL are, you know, tied up against the cap or in LTIR to get a contract in. You have something to go out and the Coyotes don't want to do that. So it really complicates things. So I understand that uh, why they want to do it, but they may not have a choice but to take something at least short term. But I don't know if that could hinder things. I hope for Chickering's sake, it doesn't mean he doesn't get treated because it's been dragging on for so long. He needs to have that resolved. But another player on the Coyotes that Friedman says should start to get of attention. It wouldn't be shocked if he's moved before the deadline. It's centerman Nick Schmaltz. Schmaltz is a player who's having a good season, a good player, uh, has a little bit of tour when was contract. And next year, his salary actually is higher than the, the cap hit. So from a you know money in, money out perspective, uh, it might not be great for the Coyotes from a financial standpoint. So trading him makes sense. At the same time, um, you can also take a look at the fact that he has a no trade clause that kicks in at the end of the season. So trading him now avoids that. They don't uh, have any restrictions of where they can move him. A team like Carolina certainly comes to mind. Uh, they like Players with term, they need a number two center. Uh, you know, obviously the Avalanche are another team. Same idea. So, you know, I'm not sure from a cap perspective how those teams will work things out. But it certainly makes sense that they could be looking at him on their radar as being a potential uh, deadline acquisition to solve their needs. So it's not just Chikrin. It's not just Shane Goss's bear. Nick Schmaltz also going to be getting a lot of attention here. And Craig Morgan, who covers the Coyotes closely for... Uh, for the Phoenix guy or for the in the Phoenix area, and I think it's called GoPhoenix.com. That's what play it is now. Of course, he's moved around a couple different places. He's reported on the Coyotes for a long time, but for a couple different outlets, and uh, he's got confirming the same thing that Schmaltz is out there and would make a lot of sense for teams looking for um, a middle six center with term. Now, could Patrick Kane end up with the Rangers? Uh, new report today for Larry Brooks and the New York Post. Confirm 100% that the Rangers 100% have Kane on the radar. And when they traded for Tarasenko, that was no slight to Kane. And they were not doing that deal to pass up an opportunity to get Patrick Kane. That was completely separate. And they're very much in the sweepstakes. So uh, that, you know, obviously I'm sure probably perked up Patrick Kane's ears when he's seen these reports or heard from his agent that the Rangers definitely have interest because that seems to be his preferred place to go when he was first told uh, and talked publicly about Tara single trade, he legitimately seemed upset that they weren't going to trade for him now because they did that other deal. And, you know, now it looks like they could do it again. As I mentioned before, it is mathematically possible, but getting more complicated by the day because they need to move out Kraft's off contract. They also would need Chicago to retain 50% of Kane's contract, and they need a third team to retain the maximum allowed or another 25%. They can get his cap it down to basically 2.6 million, but they'd have to move out Kravstov, and they might need one more thing done as well. It's, I'm not sure how they're going to make it work. It's going to be awfully close, awfully tight, but it is remotely feasible without really subtracting off the roster. So American Friedman seem to think now that things are, it's not a guarantee, of course, but it's trending towards Patrick Kane basically telling Chicago then it's the Rangers or bust. So trade me to the Rangers, which is not going to give them much leverage. And if they can't do it, then I'm just going to stay here, finish things out, and I'll figure things out in the summertime. Uh, there's still speculation that he needs a surgery to correct his hip, uh, which will obviously the sooner he can get that done, the sooner he can start recovering and work on uh, you know his plans for being an unrestricted free agent this summer. Obviously, you know that's the uh, you know, first time for him that it's going to reach that level. And he's going to want to be as healthy as he can to not shy away teams from signing him 
to a potential long-term deal or I'm not sure how many more years he really wants to play, but I would probably say he's probably looking for more than just one season. So will Patrick Kane end up in New York? Will he give the Chicago Blackhawks the ultimatum that it's there or nothing? Let me know what your thoughts are. Sure sounds like that's a possibility, although it will be complicated for the Rangers to do. It might be a tad bit expensive. So let me know your thoughts on all of today's news down in the comments and we'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you next time.